Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, a lot of what we've been talking about over the past few lectures is the theory of dynamical systems. So we started with, you know, drawing out pictures and sketches and trying to understand qualitatively what's happening with these systems. And then we got under the hood with a little bit of analysis. We showed these linearization methods, how eigenvalues and eigenvectors can help you to inform the dynamics of the system quantitatively. Now, what I would like to do is start discussing a few computational aspects to analyzing dynamical systems. Now, what I would like to start with is by emphasizing to you that discrete time systems are relatively easy to implement on a computer. Because, as we saw in the previous video and many more before that, that you can always write discrete time systems as an update. That means if you know what's happening now, you can get what's happening next. Now, if you think about how you would implement this in a computer, this would be something like a looping process. If I know what's happening now, I can put it into the equation and guess what's happening next. Then if I want to go another step into the future, I take what I know is happening next, I put it in, and then I go another step forward into the future. Now, here's the issue. Things aren't as simple when it comes to continuous time dynamical systems. So in that case, we have derivatives, which are not something that we can easily just put into a computer. And that means that we need some approximation schemes. Now we're going to talk about one of the basic approximation schemes that goes all the way back to one of our favorite mathematicians, Euler. This in fact is called Euler's method. It is a very, very simple method for approximating solutions to differential equations. And the way it does it is it turns a continuous time dynamical system into a discrete time dynamical system. Okay, so here's the basic idea. Here's what I have. I have a continuous time dynamical system. X prime is equal to f of x. In this case, you know, x could be some multidimensional function. And similarly, f is going to be a multidimensional vector valued function. Okay, let's imagine they are, they are n-dimensional. Now, what we would like to do is figure out a way to implement this on the computer. So what we can start by doing is we can remember the definition of a derivative. The derivative, by definition, is the limit as h goes to 0 of x of t plus h minus x of t divided by h. All right? This is what you learned in calculus class. We are actually going to use this in order to turn this system into an approximate difference equation. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to pick a very, very small h, right? So if this limit exists, the smaller h is, the closer I'm getting to equality in this equation, right? That's what the limit means. It means that as I approach, I am approaching into whatever this limit happens to be. So let's pick a small h greater than 0. So fix h greater than 0. Well, that tells me that my derivative now is approximately this little quotient here. Now, be careful. This is approximate, and I did not specify how big or small h has to be, right? We'll talk about that in a moment. But for now, you know, if I pick some h at least small enough, this, this limit tells me if it gets small enough, then this is exactly true. So I should be able to approximate this quotient. Now, this means that I can replace the derivative right here in my differential equation. So now I get this quotient is approximately equal to the derivative, which is just this function f. And I'm going to put of t in here just to emphasize that this is all taking place at the same moment in time. OK, so what can we do with this? Well, take a look at what's happening here. It says that for, for a very, very small h, I can approximate the derivative by this quotient here, which I know the derivative is equal to this function. 
But look it, this is at the same moment of time right here. This is exactly h units of time into the future. So think about this in terms of a discrete dynamical system. I know what's happening currently. Then I can rearrange this equation to know what's going to happen next. Right? So if I take this equation and I open it up, what's going to happen next is I'm going to just make this equality now, just, uh, just for the sake of simplifying the presentation. Bring the h up. I have x of t plus h f of x of t. This right here is called the Euler method, sometimes called the forward Euler method because we are going forward in time, right? H is pushing us a little step forward in time. It's saying if I know exactly what's happening at one instant in time, I can push myself forward to the next instant in time. Now, you can actually repeat this procedure, right? So let's imagine you're given an initial condition. Okay, so we actually do know what happens at one point in time, and that's when t is equal to zero. Well then, through this Euler step, that would tell me that x of h, so going h time units into the future, is x of zero plus h f of x of zero. T is equal to zero in this case. Now I'm pushing myself forward by some little time unit. This would also give me, if I wanted to push forward again by another unit of h, I'd say x of 2h, right? So h plus h. This is equal to whatever happened previously plus this derivative component. All right, so I took... Let's use a different color. I took this information and I put it onto the right side here. All right, that means that I could keep going. I could go three H's into the future and this would be whatever I was doing at two H into this right hand side and then manipulating that in order to get what's going on in the future, right? So you can see every single time I use what I was given it approximates where I'm going. Then I know where I'm going, I use it to approximate further. Then I use that to approximate further. And you can keep going so that if I wanna go say n plus one times h units into the future, this is just knowing what I did n units in the future and then putting it into this equation. Okay, so that gives me a way of basically creating a looping procedure, right? I know where I start, I put it in, and then I put that in, and then I put that in, and I keep going. This is a for looping procedure that you're doing that can be implemented very quickly and very efficiently on a computer. But there's one thing that I really, really want you to keep in mind. The key here is that, right there, approximately equal. This is not the exact derivative. The exact derivative requires a limit. That means that this is gonna be off by just a little bit. And it means that every time you implement this thing, you are going to have a little bit of error. It's not gonna be the exact solution to the differential equation. It's going to give you a little error. But now think about what happens. You sort of cascade the error forward, right? So I know exactly where I started, but now I have a little bit of error in approximating where I am h units in the future. Then I put that little bit of error in and I approximate two h units in the, in the future. So I have error from the previous step plus error from the approximation. Then I take the error from that step and I get another error from the approximation. So you can see that there's sort of a cascading error here. The further I go into the future, the more error is being accumulated, right? So this is the computational trade-off that happens. Clearly, I want h to be very, very small so that this is extremely accurate. 
But if h is really, really small, then it takes forever to get anywhere, right? Imagine h is one over a thousand. That means I need to do this process a thousand times to just go one time unit into the future. Everything we've spoken about so far talks about t going to infinity. One is a very far off uh, unit from infinity, which means that you know this, this computer program could be potentially running for a very, very long time. Or you could also do this by hand, except you probably don't want to run a thousand iterations of this by hand in order to just go one unit in the future. So this is the trade-off that happens here. Clearly we want h to be as big as we possibly can get it, but if h is too big, then at every stage here, we're just accumulating too much error and we might be you know, returning results that have nothing to do with the original equation. Now, there's a really nice way of visualizing how the uh, error actually accumulates in this thing. Okay, so imagine this is t and let's say this is x of t, okay? So I'm gonna draw it as a one dimensional function, but it doesn't really matter how you think of this. And okay, so let's imagine we start right here at x naught, okay? So this is my initial value and we know from, say, existence uniqueness theorems that this thing has a solution as long as f is, you know, continuous, uh, then it locally at least can be extended into a solution. So let's imagine my solution looks like this. Okay, so I kind of just made it up. Now, what is this process actually doing? Well, this is f of x is the tangent. It's the equation of the slope of the tangent through the specific point. In particular, this is the equation of the tangent at h units in the future. So I'm going to really exaggerate up my, my picture, okay? So imagine h is way up here, okay? So, I mean, the picture maybe is really, really zoomed in. Well, what's happening? I have a tangent line that goes through this point. It's tangent to the original solution. It goes up h units in the future. And it gives me that value right there. So, you know, by my super exaggerated picture, you can see exactly the, how this error has accumulated already. I am approximating this thing with a line, even though it's a very, very curvy function, right? So again, it's Taylor, right? It's the Taylor approximation coming in again. Everything is always Taylor. It's the same linearization process that lies at the heart of the stable manifold theorem, Hartman-Grobman theorem. It's always the same thing, just approximating things with lines. Then in this case, maybe what I would do, well, this is telling me to now move in the direction of the tangent, but the tangent to my approximation now, not to the exact value. So maybe that tangent, so the original tangent would be somewhere right along here. Maybe this tangent gives me something that looks like this. And I move forward to the two h units, right? So I've got an error right here, and I've got an error right here. And now imagine my tangent gives me something way over here, right? So this is the basic process that Newton is doing. It says, I know where you started, I'm gonna approximate it with a tangent and push you forward. But now you are approximating a tangent from an approximation so you get a double whammy of errors and you push yourself forward and maybe you've widened the gap here. And again, double whammy of errors, you used an approximate value to push yourself forward, plus you approximate the tangent, which cascades you into a larger error. And let's imagine that the next piece is way over here. Okay, so again, this is just a badly exaggerated uh, uh, picture here, but it's really illustrating what's at play. Because 
every time you push that thing forward, you take all of the errors that you had before and you just roll them up and you put another piece of error on top of that, okay? So I really, really want you to, to sort of understand how this works. Uh, where you have this for looping process that is very, very simple, very easy to implement, but it comes at a cost, right? It can accumulate error if H is too large, or it can take too long if H is too small. Nonetheless, it works quite well. So for example, if you go back to my, uh, my uh, RLC circuit, that I presented to you uh, a few lectures ago. So you might remember this by x1 prime is equal to x1 minus x1 cubed minus x2, and x2 prime is equal to, in this case it was x1. In this case, you have instability of the only equilibrium point at zero, zero. But you can also examine the vector field and see that eventually everything is sort of pushing you in. So that means you're getting pushed out from the middle, getting sucked in from infinity. So the question is, what happens in between? Well, you can implement a nice little Newton, or sorry, a nice little Euler scheme using this basic process. And you can actually find that this is what's happening. So, if this is your x1, x2 plane, you are actually spiraling out. And there is something that catches you. And that thing that catches you is a big, beautiful, what we call limit cycle. It is a periodic orbit. It's a closed circle in your phase plane. It's similar to what we saw with the Romeo and Juliet model, except with Romeo and Juliet, we saw infinitely many of them. They're all nested inside of each other. In this case, there's one. There is exactly one limit cycle. And it you can think of it as the balance point. I said everybody's pulling you in from way out, and you're getting pushed out from, from inside. There is this little ring of balance that exists that you sort of get stuck on, okay? And in this case, you can find this thing by implementing the Euler process right here. So I believe I implemented this with h is equal to 0.1. Uh, but on top of this, we get a sensitivity analysis that we can perform, right? So if we find some, you know, the existence of maybe one of these periodic orbits with a certain value of h, we want to see if it's actually there, if it's just a weird numerical artifact, right? Maybe I'm jumping way too much and I'm, I'm sort of creating something that didn't actually exist. Well, then what you would do is you would decrease the value of H and you would, you would run it again and see if you still observe that phenomenon, right? So again, it's a robustness computation. It's a sensitivity computation. Same things we've been doing over and over, except the difference here is now we're doing it to check our own work, right? We, we think, or we saw the existence of one of these periodic orbits, these limit cycles, but we wanna be sure that we're actually doing this properly, so we have to use smaller and smaller values of H, which makes this more and more accurate, which means less and less error accumulates. The only difference there is, or the only drawback to doing this, is it could take us a longer time, right? So we could be stuck at our computer waiting for a little bit longer to really push forward through this Euler method because we're taking shorter steps as we go through. So what I would love for you to do is try and implement this. Try and implement the Euler method yourself using a simple little for loop on this thing and see if you can see that periodic orbit. Remember, this is an x1, x2 space. That means that the values of x1 and x2 are repeating over and over. Time is embedded underneath or sort of inside of this. It's just indicated by the motion of my arrows here. If you actually plotted out what x1 of t and x2 of t look like, they would converge up into something, some periodic signal, you know, something that would look like a sine or a cosine type thing. So let me know if you're able to do it. I would love to see some, some nice results. And I'll see you in the next lecture for a little bit of a, an introduction to data science.